This episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, there were men that were dancing, creeping, and crooked. But there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? What's a tantalus? Or a gasogene? And what's the difference between a handsome cab and a four-wheeler? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 204, The Location of 221B, Part 2. Well, hello, and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look at the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And boy, Bert, this is a particularly uh, momentous episode. This is the last episode in November of 2020 as we prepare for December coming upon us. But uh, more interestingly, this Episode 204 actually marks the time when we now have as many Trifles episodes as we do of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere episodes. Wow. I know, right? Have have we actually weighed them and compared the weights? (laughs) Yes, we are uh, approximately two megabytes uh, heavier here on trifles because we are concentrated. Um, oh, <laughs> yeah, but we're we're uh, this this is impressive. So it took us four seasons here on trifles to to manage two hundred four episodes, and it took us fourteen seasons of I hear of Sherlock everywhere. Um, That's amazing. You know, I think. If we if we write this up, I think in enough detail, it could be very useful to particle physicists and others who are interested in in string theory and in multiple dimensions. <laughs> is 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 trifles like the TARDIS? It's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. It is definitely like the TARDIS. You know, we call the show trifles, but uh, it's probably uh, more widely discussed between you and I than anything else. So it, it is anything but a trifle. <laughs> oh, that's right. Well, then, until next time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the show notes uh, for this episode are available at iHose.co slash trifles204b. Why B? Well, because I screwed up the last time when I put the <laughs> the I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere episode in and accidentally put in the trifles uh, moniker. So, um, it, it, and it's because we're crossing streams here. So, ihose.co slash trifles 204b. Uh, that'll take you to the show notes for this episode where we will have links and mentions of the various uh, articles and uh, books that we're talking about with regard to the location of 221B. Uh, you can also leave us a comment there. Let us know what you think of the show. And please, if you are listening to us on you know, whatever platform you are, leave us a rating and a review. We do appreciate your support. And by reviewing the show, or rating the show, you help other people find it as well. So thank you for your service in that regard. Now let's get over to the numbering of 221B. Now, in the last episode, we talked about some of the geography and the, the basics of uh, Baker Street. Uh, there was no uh, Baker Street that extended above uh, number 85 in those years. It was only when Upper Baker Street and York Place were incorporated uh, to to extend it to an entire length of Baker Street that we had enough numbers. Um, Michael Harrison in 
the Baker Street Journal in 1964, um, mentioned exactly how uh, the street was numbered at the time. This is interesting because uh, I don't know if this was something that was common uh, in many cities, but with regard to Baker Street of 1881, um, he, he said it was only about a third of the length of its contemporary successor. Um, and the, the east side ran from number one at the corner of Lower Berkeley uh, to number 42 at the corner of Paddington Street. And the numbers ran consecutively. And so rather than having an odd side and an even side of the street, um, you had one through 42 on the east side of the street and then uh, 44 through 85 on the opposite side of the street. Do you know if that's something that's unique to Baker Street, unique to London, Bert? No, I don't. It's interesting. So, uh, but in doing so, there there was no number 43. That's an interesting omission. Um, but it was in in those times, um, I, I believe that uh, Dr. Gray Chandler Briggs visited uh, the city. He was a radiologist from St. Louis and uh, an early correspondent with um, with Vincent Starrett. As a matter of fact, uh, their correspondence was what made up uh, the first volume in the Baker Street Irregulars History series called uh, Dear Chandler, Dear uh, excuse me, Dear Briggs, Dear Starrett, I believe it was called. Um, and uh, this is where uh, Dr. Briggs mentioned to Vincent Starrett that he had traveled to London and um, made some observations about the the streets and tried to identify exactly where 221B would have been and uh, where the empty house was. Yeah, and it's it's a lovely thing. And, of course, anyone who visits London and loves Sherlock Holmes always makes a pilgrimage to Baker Street. So in a way, that continues today. But doing that sort of takes you away from what many scholars have dug into, um, you know, with, with very useful results. And that is looking at the evidence of the stories. And a great place to start is in the adventure of the empty house, because there's a route described. And, and we'll, we'll, we can do this for a couple of stories. Actually, there are three or four, I think, that are really key to pulling out where the location of Baker Street could be, but of 221B. But in the adventure of the empty house, Holmes and Watson travel this route from Cavendish Square into Manchester Street and so on to Blandford Street and then down a narrow passage. And, of course, at the end of this, um, Holmes will say to Watson, well, do you, uh, you know, do you know where we are? And Watson says, well, that must be that must be Baker Street. And Holmes says, yes, yes, we're in the empty house, you know, across the road. Well, um, Bill Baring Gould, in a paper in the Baker Street Journal and an expansion of that essay that appeared in the annotated Sherlock Holmes in the 1960s, points, uh, dwells in, digs in to uh, that route and this narrow passage. So they go from Cavendish Square to Manchester Street, Blandford Street, down a narrow passage. And Barry Gould says this narrow passage must be one of two, Kendall Mews leading south or Blandford Mews leading north. So down a narrow passage seems to indicate that Holmes and Watson turned south into Kendall Mews because if they'd gone north, Watson might better have said up a narrow passage rather than down a narrow passage. And this in turn would mean the 221 Baker Street, which stood opposite Camden House, which was the empty house, was on the west side of Baker Street. And that's what we were just talking about, about the house numbers on one side being different than the house numbers, house number sequence on the other side. So that puts 221 Baker Street on the west side of Baker Street between George Street on the south and uh, King, the King Blandford streets on the north, which puts it, here's the point, it puts it among the present numbers 19 to 35. Hmm. And uh, Baring Gould then turns to Gavin Brend, 
who uh, looked at um, further evidence in the Hound of the Baskervilles that 221 was north of Blandford Street. Uh, he said there's there's one further argument which I have not previously put forward. It's it is that if the arguments which I have put forward as stage number two in my dear Holmes that both cabs were in the same block, that there was at least 50 yards between them, and that halfway down the street means halfway between 221B and the nearest side street behind the cab, and that neither cab stopped at a street corner, that if all these are accepted, then it follows that Dorset Street, Blandford Street, must be the correct site, since there's none other long enough in the whole length of the street. (laughs) How interesting. And then, you know, you can get into, um, you know, many other alternatives here. Uh, Baron Gould takes us into H.W. Bell, who had a completely different route in his book, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, the chronology of their adventures. He speculates that they would have kept on going kept on through Kenrick Place, which was then Dorchester Mews, and then at Paddington Street, have turned right, you know, et cetera, et cetera. This is one of these lovely things, you know, that's really helpful if you're obviously sitting looking at a map of how these streets were laid out uh, around this time. But at the end of all of that, 221 would then be on the west side of Baker Street between Dorset Street on the south and Marlebin Road on the north, which, you know, it gets us, uh, you know, pretty much to, uh, I think, number 109. Um, anyway, we're, you know, we're certainly in that general area. Yeah, and these, these numbers are uh, swimming around in my head. So why don't, we, why don't we pause here for station identification and a word from our sponsor, and we'll come back and look at some of these numbers in more detail. Stay tuned. You know, it's all well and good to have a subscription to the Baker Street Journal. In fact, the most recent issue just recently came out and is making its way to mailboxes all over the world. But when you're looking for scholarship past rather than present, the easiest way to go about finding that is with the EBSJ. The EBSJ is a PDF archive that provides a complete set of the Baker Street Journal from its inception in 1946 all the way through 2011 on a single DVD in PDF format. That's 276 issues with more than 18,000 pages spanning the old series, the Christmas annuals, and the new series all the way through 2011. Will there be another EBSJ to update us in the last decade? Well, we certainly hope so. What format will it take? Well, that's up to you to find out. But get the EBSJ version 2 on DVD while it's still around. Find it online at BakerStreetIrregulars.com. And we left you at number 109, Baker Street. And this is, this is interesting because uh, at the time Baring Gould was writing this in the late 50s, early 60s, um, Baker Street was vastly different than it was, uh, well, n- not even 20 years before. Because uh, recall that in World War II, London uh, underwent the Blitz, And a number of houses on Baker Street were destroyed as part of that, and there was a renumbering that occurred. So you've got people that are looking at, uh, you know, numbers, oh, 35 and um, uh, some of the the, the lower numbers on Baker Street, uh, 49, 61, etc. And then, uh, then suddenly we arrive at numbers 109 or 111. Uh, when Dr. Briggs arrived on the scene and H.W. Bell arrived on the scene. Um, so there, there's that sudden shift in numbering uh, that we're seeing. Uh, so uh, Bell says uh, our own choice is 109. Uh, there's a colorless brick front, three first floor windows and chimney pots, just as Dr. Watson described them. If further proof is needed in favor of number 109, consider the opposite side of the roadway and note the yellow-faced front 
of 114 Baker Street. Watson drew special attention to the glare of the sunlight upon the yellow brickwork of the house opposite in his record of the strange case of Miss Susan Cushing in the cardboard box. Well, there's a lot of evidence that can be put forward against choosing uh, numbers 109 and number 111, 111. Because, among other things, in those days, obviously, those locations were not in Baker Street at all, but they were in York Place. But there's also internal evidence in the story. So, for example, in the Red-Headed League, Watson walks briskly across Hyde Park from his home in Kensington to meet Holmes at 10 for the end of the plans of uh, the Red-Headed League. So we know Watson is on on foot, and we know that he leaves at 9.15. Well, you know, other people have noted that it really would have been impossible for anyone to walk that distance uh, in that time. If we're talking about number 101. Hmm. And there are another... um, there's another set of challenges around identifying 221 as, as the modern number 111 because it would, and by the way, number 111 that Gray Chandler Briggs saw was uh, demolished in World War II. Um, so you can't really go looking for that today. <laughs> but it would it would place you on the left-hand side of Baker Street going north somewhere between... Um, York Street and Marylebone, or well towards the main line railway station. But that theory becomes untenable when you think about the blue carbuncle and the route that Commissioner Peterson took to get home after um, his Christmas nip. Um, And if you look at the map, the natural direction would have been, if anyone is bound for any point in Baker Street, you know, the route would not have uh, taken him, uh, you know, in that, in that general description, you know, if that was, if that was the location. Well, and then uh, I know there's that, that famous scene in the barrel coronet too, where you've got um, Alexander Holder making his way up the street. Um, and, and that actually provides an objection for uh, one eleven that. that's, um, it's too close to the Baker Street Underground Station. A passenger from the Underground would not take a cab to visit Holmes. He would sooner he would no sooner have gotten into the cab than he would have had to, to get out again, right? And so Alexander Holder was described as using a cab, and that wouldn't have made sense if he was that close to the to the Tube Station. Yeah, that's true. But you know, there is there is also. Um some more positive evidence to support the claim of 109-111. And that's in the resident patient, because in the resident patient, Holmes and Watson are walking home from Brook Street late one October night. And Watson records, we had crossed Oxford Street and were halfway down Harley Street before I could get a word out of my companion. And so the, the significance of all of that is what were they doing halfway down Harley Street? It was at least 11 p.m., and earlier in the evening, they'd strolled around Fleet Street and the Strand for three hours, which is a very tiring exercise. And when they um, first returned to 221, Watson had spoken very cozily about our sanctum. And so they're in 221B, and they have to listen to Dr. um, Trevelyan, and then had been whisked off to his somber, flat-faced Fiat Face House at 403 Brook Street, and we're now on the way back. So they're, so they're going home. They're not making a final turn. And there's no suggestion of a late supper or anything like that. Um, so it's reasonable they'd go home by the most direct route. And now the problem there, of course, is 403 Brook Street is clearly a fictitious number. Um, but there can be little doubt about its position. It must have been at the extreme end of Brook Street uh, on the corner of Hanover Square, and there are certainly sets of reasons for that. And thus, they could have walked along Harley Street without going out of their way to Baker Street, but it depends on which part of Baker Street. 
And so, um, mm. important note, uh, you know, is that it's really sort of a direct way to 109 or 111. So the, so the reasonable assumption is that they would avoid unnecessary distance. And that gets you, uh, you know, between 111 and 109. Uh, hmm. Baker Street. Well, the debates rage on. Um, you know, there's a particularly good piece by Bernard Davies in the Sherlock Holmes Journal, uh, volume four, number three, from the winter of 1959. And, you know, you have to hand it to uh, London Holmesians. You know, they, they have access to uh, the geography and to the, the sites uh, at, at their uh, beck and call. They, they don't have to travel transatlantically to uh, investigate these. And Bernard Davies from the Sherlock Holmes Society of London uh, really did a, a masterful job uh, in this piece from the Sherlock Holmes Journal. Um, and, and he looked at physical characteristics of some of the buildings and concluded that only number 31 uh, made the most sense um, because it, um, it, it, it uh, is the only backyard in the entire street which answers our description. A, a glance at the survey of 1921, he writes, shows that this yard remained intact for many years. Once more, note the map recording the disappearance of so many yards with the march of commerce points to the uncanny precision, with uncanny precision, to the true site of 221B. The clenching argument is, of course... Plain as a pike staff, numbers 31 and 34 are opposite each other. Not dead opposite, but near enough for the sight line to be no more than 50 to 20 degrees off. So he determines that that would have made sense with regard to the empty house. Our half-mile search of Baker Street could come to no more happy and reassuring end. Yeah, and that sight line refers to Colonel Sebastian Moran's ability to take a pot shot at home. So, so it's very, it's really entertaining. And it's a lot of fun. You know, I'm sorry that my own pet theory over the years has never been, you know, more greatly welcomed by the vast mass of Sherlockians. <laughs> well, in the meantime, we shall keep 221B firmly secure in the corners of our mind. And that is no trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You take my breath away, Mr. Holmes. It's an ugly, dangerous business, Watson. Believe me, I shall be very glad to have you back safe and sound in Baker Street once more. Thank you, Holmes.